All right, and we are back with Kelsey McDaniel. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Good. Thank you for jumping in. Yeah. 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 How are things going? How's uh... busy as always? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we were talking about your personal life a little bit. Your you live in North Powder. I mean, if you know, and it, but you're relocating. Yeah. You're, you're building. Yeah. So you're kind of in the midst of. Uh, adjusting life. I mean, you're yeah. part way, halfway through. I mean, you, I, you know, you, you can talk about that. I'm sorry. We That's did, okay. <laughs> we did, yeah. I didn't know if you want to talk about that or not, but yeah. We're remodeling a house in Cove yeah. and it's a slow process and my husband's the contractor, so I can't fire him. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. um, but we're really excited and our kids go to Cove. Um, yeah. we'll miss North powder cause we really like the community and my husband's been on the fire department for years and we have made some really great friends but we're really excited for the property that we have there yeah, yeah. and so uh and i think i mean i think I, we just came through this election cycle and nobody ran for mayor in, in north powder yeah. Right? yeah yeah i've what's heard um i've heard there was like some miscommunication and i don't quote me on this because right, this is right. like rumor on the streets right. yeah. <laughs> um, that there was some miscommunication about who was going to be running and then didn't end up running. And so there were some pretty active write-in campaigns. Like there were signs up oh, for okay. write-in. Okay. So yeah, I, it was all write-in. There was just one. I mean, I think I only saw one too. Like, I saw two. Was there two? Yeah. John Freebos and Steve Butcher. Oh, they put, they put names in now? Well, yeah. no, what the, what the, if you're, if you're running for a write-in campaign, you like put signs out, write me in. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I was yeah. talking about like in the actual votes. No, like, oh, no, no, no. I just know that those were two signs that, that I saw, saw around town. And, I haven't been to North Powder, so I didn't. And I know John, so I knew he yeah. was, he was the mayor previously. So huh. he just used his previous signs and put the sticker yeah. on his head. Right in. Dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, not yeah. on the ballot. Yeah. yeah. So, but I didn't see on the election results who ended up winning. So uh, it doesn't show. That's what I was That's saying. That's right. I'm no not sure. Name. Yeah. yeah. There's no name. So it just says write in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll, if well, somebody I knows, that, type that, it in the comments. I mean, the, I don't know. It, it takes like, you know, I, I mean, it takes like a week or a couple of weeks for the election to be certified and all of that business. And so I would imagine part of that is the write in tallies. Well, I, yeah, I would assume that the write-in is a little bit more complicated because there's always write-ins for every race, even right. if, yeah. you know, there's only one candidate. Right. Um, so I'm assuming that that's why it's taking yeah. a little longer. Yeah, I'm sure people like Donald Duck. Yeah, they're, I mean... I wonder what the strangest thing somebody has. <laughs> you know what? They won't tell you. Really? Yeah, because yeah. I used to ask Robin Church. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, maybe now that she's not the... Not, maybe oh, maybe she'd she, tell you now? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I don't know. That would be funny. I don't know. I did ask her once, and she said she wouldn't tell us. That's funny. <laughs> now, I did. I think I did see where you endorsed one of the county commissioner yeah. candidates. Yes. So I did. I endorsed Jake Siebert. Um, he reached out to me and wanted to come and learn about my office and um, what issues were coming. He had some ideas and mm -hmm. wanted to see what I thought, um, was really approachable, really interested, and learning about the right. public safety aspect. And then it was interesting to see too, that he, um, obviously he focuses on agriculture as his kind of wheelhouse, uh -huh. but he was really interested in how public safety affects agriculture and communities in that way. And so, um, I, I was really pleased to see that he was successful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, look, yeah. I'm looking forward to working with him. Well, and, and we did, yeah, us too, but I guess I'm interested to know in how do you, how did you decide as a standing, having a standing position, endorsing somebody? What was your thought? In this case? That? Yeah. He asked. Okay. But I, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no, I mean, but endorsing anybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, what, how, when you're, because I know the commissioners were kind of in that same place, you know, I mean, so Donna, who is outgoing, she endorsed Jake. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But, but. Anyhow, so I don't know if it did. Um, well, I think so. Public employees can't endorse someone in the capacity as a public employee. So um, a police officer or a deputy DA can't say, I'm a deputy DA for Union County and okay. I endorse Sheriff Bowen. Got right. it. Got it. Okay. So I feel like a lot of times um, elected officials have an obligation 
to say I have the ability to endorse someone. I work in this field and this is what I know from my position. I don't always endorse, um, but I do look at it carefully. I did endorse um, uh, Will Lathrop for attorney general as well. Um, unfortunately, he didn't win. I was really excited. I he did. No, he, no. Won our, he, he had the high, uh, oh, he, he won oh, our man. county, but yeah. okay. on a state level, he will, yeah. He lost on the state level, but I mean, I had multiple meaningful meetings right. and no, conversations too, yeah. with him. Um, and same with Jake Seaver, um, that right. he, and then he asked, um, I've never met Mark Simmons and I don't know him. So, right. um, but it wasn't so, like where well, there was two dueling requests. Right. But what you're saying is, is that you, you're not endorsing as the DA, you're endorsing as a person. No, no. she's endorsing as a DA cause she's elected. She's saying that people that are hired that, that are public employees can't endorse, but she can because she's in an elected position right is that right yeah okay. so like for example um a public employee can endorse as a private citizen okay um and say you know oh i work with kids or oh i work in law enforcement but they yeah. can't say i'm right. a police officer. i'm a police officer for this agency i work with this person and this okay. is what my experience is okay. um but i can do that okay. and so i think a lot of elected officials have an obligation sometimes yeah. to say this is what i know about it obviously you can't always do that because there's yeah nuances and other reasons. So I ha I don't jump into every race, but yeah. if I'm asked by a candidate, I certainly take it seriously and consider it. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah. All right. So no, I'm, 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 we, you know, we try and stay publicly neutral because yeah. of, uh, because I mean, we still have candidates come and go and so on and so forth, but we For were, sure. we're, we, you know, in, internally, I mean, Kyle grew up with Jake. They went to school together. You know, I'd together. have, yep. yeah, I've had, I mean, I was, I'm really pleased that Jake won. So, yeah. I, like I was just really um, flattered and impressed that he wanted to come and learn. Um, and He's a good dude. Did not really like selling himself so much as yeah. asking like, okay, yeah. if, if I win this position, tell me what I need to know about your office. Right. And you know, what it would be, he asked me um, what kind of support would be helpful in terms of funding and grant writing and things like that. Like how can the county support elected officials or department heads? Um, and he had some different ideas to bounce off of me in terms of like, would this be a good use of resources to assist you with this? Yeah. That kind of thing. And um, I really appreciated that. That's a, a really a great place to start. No, and I, I've said this before that, so I do all of the city council meetings at uh, Legrand and have done them for a number of years. And over the course of time, I've seen people run for city council positions, mm -hmm. but never seen them at an actual city council meeting. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, and so then, you know, so then when I started running or considered running for county commissioner, I mean, I wanted to know, I mean, I... I felt like there was a lot that I needed to prepare myself for. Yeah. So then I, I really respect when people will make an effort at trying to, I mean, candidates mm -hmm. will make an effort to try and educate themselves, you know, yeah. because I think it's meaningful. It means that they're, they really are trying to learn. For so, sure. Yeah. It's making me start to feel old though, because like all these people, like the, the sheriff, the mayor, now a commissioner are all like my classmates. It's making me feel old, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. <laughs> well, and you know what's funny? Is, I mean, you and I have talked about this before, is there is a whole bunch of people your age, yeah. you know, that are involved in local leadership here. That's you good. Know? That's yeah. good. Because like, I, I mean, think Cody, that, you knew. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a whole list of them. Yeah. It, it, I always, so growing up here, I always got the feeling that it was like a good old boys club. And, yeah. and it kind of was. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like, they're, they're, and I feel like that's kind of transitioning over into, like, a little bit more of a younger, like, approach to the, you know, how, how we're going to take this, try, try to make LeGrand a better place to live in Union County. I mean, and, yeah. and, because, like, when I was a kid, like, it was always the same, you know, the same people, you know, like, in, in and it's it's almost like they they were still here all the way up until like 
Cody and you know like took over. It, it was. It's just. Yeah, I, I like it actually. I, yeah. I I can feel old as long as I feel comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Well, and what you what you see over a tra- a period of time is is that. I mean, that's kind of how society works. I mean, you have a group of people and they know each other and they kind of grow older and they they become the leaders in a community together. And, you know, and so, yeah, 20 years from now, you all will be, you know, I mean, there will be a generation, hopefully, that yeah. will replace you. Yeah. yeah, you know, and so it's that's just the, the trend of life. The thing I worry about, though, is like the organizations like uh, Optimus and... Um, stuff like that because they, uh, my generation yeah, yeah. doesn't isn't real interested in that, yeah. and, and so they're really struggling with getting people to to sign up. I mean, I have a couple friends, the Hickeys, yeah. uh, Jim and Nick, dad and son, um, and they keep just pestering me like, sign up, come along to like, yeah. come to a meeting. I mean, I actually put the meeting on my calendar this yeah. month because I want to make an effort. But there's just not a lot of people to fill the the void of all these people that are getting older and dying and you know yeah well and i can talk about it but let's let's yeah. come let's <laughs> talk let's talk i want to come back to kelsey so but i would be interested what are some you know outside of your area of law enforcement the other end of law enforcement and so on and so forth you know what are some of the things that you see in the county that you wish we did a better job of. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, because I mean, the big things of housing and economic development and, you know, I mean, all of that is very much adjacent to your leadership. But I don't know, what you have any thoughts on some of that stuff? I mean, to be honest, something that is a huge gap for us is um, mental health services yeah. and uh, drug and alcohol Addiction services. services yep. um, and I'm kind of piggybacking on what you're saying about like new waves of leadership. Something that I really value and I feel like I've worked hard to earn is um, when we're coming up with ideas or looking at those kinds of things, um, we all work really well together in terms of this is a problem. How are we going to solve it? Mm -hmm. Um, And one of those examples is there's actually an opioid abatement committee that was recently um, established. And we had kind of been working on it informally for a while. Um, The states all got, um, or the counties rather, and some cities got opioid settlement funds Mm -hmm. from suing the big drug corporations. Mm -hmm. um, And we're expected to get that funding over the course of about 18 years. And so we started having kind of some ad hoc meetings of like, okay, what are we going to do with this? Mm -hmm. And something that we need is treatment. treatment. We don't have respite beds. So if somebody is having a mental health crisis, they're either in the ER or the jail, which neither of those places are designed to treat someone who's having a mental health crisis. We don't have detox beds, which is basically when someone is coming off of a drug, they may need medical care. Mm -hmm. Um, Or alcohol. Or alcohol, that's true. I mean, I guess it's considered a drug too. Um, But any sort of substance, if you will, that requires medical care in yeah. order for them to come off of that drug. We don't have those beds. We also don't have any inpatient care. And right now, that's the hardest thing for us right now. We had a, a an individual that we're working with in the court system through the drug court. And through that discussion and putting that person on a list, I learned that he was um, number 86 on a list to get a bed to go to treatment. That's crazy. Which to me is insane. And we don't have a facility here. Baker does, Umatilla does, Hermiston. Hermiston. We're sending people to the coast when we can get them in. But even then, you have somebody who's actively using, who's coming forward and saying, I want help. Right. Please help me. Right. And we're going to say, here, fill out this packet and we'll call you. Right. Um, that To me, that's unacceptable. Right. Especially yeah. because that intersection with public safety, that person who's making these, you know, I mean... Addiction is such a struggle anyway, but a lot of times that's where we see that foray into criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, We have to do something to intervene and change that situation because we know that these people live in our community. And I don't think it's acceptable for them to be dying while they're asking for help. Right. So um, we are working on, um, with a consultant, Pinnacle um, Consulting has been contracted with the county 
to and the uh, opioid abatement committee to work on feasibility and plans for how much would it cost? What kind of um, facility would we need? What would the ongoing structure be to see whether or not our county can accommodate and sustain something like that um, so that we can try to take care of our own right, um, yeah. as opposed to trying to get the crumbs from other places. Um, so I'm excited about that to yeah. hopefully, um, I mean, this is at the very beginning of the steps, but it's definitely further than we've ever gotten before. Um, instead of another, you know, Facebook ad campaign about fentanyl being bad, yeah. we need to do something that um, really might affect people and save some lives here. Yeah, right. I, th I think we, as a county, we we got to stop talking about it and do it. Well, well, that, and, and that's, that's kind of what we're doing. That was kind of my right. point when you're talking about like fresh perspectives and things like that. At mm -hmm. the table, you have the sheriff, the chief, um, Commissioner Scarfo, myself, um, juvenile department, parole and probation, CHD. Um, and these different and community members, et cetera, who are saying, we need to figure out how to do this. And then hiring the right people to tell us, this is our expertise. This is how many beds you can sustain. And here's where the federal government will mess it up for you. And like, right. yeah. Um, yeah. these different things to try to, hopefully we come out of it with a package that says, hey, you can do this. I mean, there is a possibility they'll say, no, stick with farming it out you can't sustain <laughs> this because either we don't have enough housing or the job market's not there that kind of stuff but hopefully they can tell us this is what you've identified as the need um this is the numbers that you can expect and here's how you can make it happen so then we can go boots on the ground and take off running and get this done i don't know why we have and, and maybe we have but i don't know why we haven't like sat down and had a real conversation with new horizons in baker and said, hey, figure out a way to get us a place over here. Like, you guys do this. This is what you do. I mean, it's like their biggest part of their whole organization is inpatient treatment. They have a men's right. house. They have a women's house. They do outpatient. Like, hey, come on. Come on. Like, yeah. you, like get a place over here. And, and you know what I mean? Branch out a little. So different communities do things well in yeah. different ways. And I know, I don't want to speak for them, but I know New Horizons is expanding in and of itself. Right. Um, in Baker, um, there are some things that we do well. We have really good sober living houses. Yeah. So we have a lot of transitional housing for people that have gone through treatment or living in a sober living environment, which Baker doesn't have as much of that. Our plan for this is that we would um, get this proposal done as a result of this committee, and then we would open it up for um, negotiations and bids, gotcha. an RFP, if you will, for different entities who might be interested in taking on that body of work. And I don't know what the timeline is. We're not right. there in the project, but I'm assuming that those conversations will happen with those different possible entities about who might be interested in partnering. I mean, certainly the county is not going to, or the committee is not going to um, take on that body of work. No. So yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. going to be looking for yeah. an entity that already does that to, to say, hey, this is, we will support you in this endeavor here's how we would go about doing it, and this is what we're looking for. So nice. is this, who's on that, who makes up that committee? Um, it was a commission appointment, and so um, off the top of my head, it's the sheriff, um, the chief, myself, Commissioner Scarfo, um, the head of the juvenile department, the head of um, CHD Behavioral Health, Barb Cedar, okay. um, head of parole and probation, Travis Miller, um, and then um, Brittany Price representing Grand Run Hospital, okay. uh, Matt Christensen, I think, for CHD and also from lived experience. Um, he was a peer recovery mentor and a treatment court graduate. Okay. Um, and then also um, uh, Kylie Ingerson from the um, Oregon Judicial Department. Kara Rudd from the Judicial Department and Judge Tom Powers. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, which is good, but... I mean, I, I've been on a number of boards and committees in, you know, actually moving something through something like that. I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm with Kyle in that it's like, man, we've been talking about this for a long time. But we've never gotten this far. Right. I know. And, um, and, so then, and I'm really optimistic about it right. because the people that I just named are people that get things done. No. And I, and I don't, I mean... And I'm surprised that you, you did a really good job of listing all those people. So 
No, I'm, I guess I, I just, I'm hopeful that we can just like, we've got to move off the dime here. For I mean, sure. we should have been moving off the dime two years ago when, when, you know what I mean? When we, when, because of measure 110, we saw the result oh, of everything. Oh, and Robert Strope. I yeah. forgot Bob, okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so that's, so then, so then tie that piece together with, you know, the revision of 110 that came into enforcement in September and kind of catches yeah, up on what's changed the too? Yeah. I want to know what's changed. Since well, then. yeah, and how you, how okay. how Union <laughs> County is interpreting yeah. what they can. Yeah. Okay, so 110. Okay, so 110 is what made it no longer criminal to possess. Um, hard drugs, controlled substances, if you will. So it made most things violations. There were a couple wonky things in that. I mean, that was a, in my personal opinion, it was a garbage led piece of legislation to start. I told most everyone, people. I told everyone I knew at the time, right. <laughs> this yeah. is really bad. Um, and then 4002 was the quote unquote legislative fix. The problems and, you know, if you break something, fixing it is always a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, Originally, uh, controlled substances were felony crimes. So possession of a controlled substance, if you had a meth pipe in your pocket, that's a felony. Um, it dropped down to a misdemeanor. 4002 then created it into being what's called an unclassified misdemeanor. That means that instead of falling into a category of an A, B, or C misdemeanor, it's its own unique animal. And so in that statute itself, it says, and here's what the consequences can be. Then the state has allocated money and really done this huge push for uh, what's called deflection, um, which we're not super excited about that term deflection. We're kind of referring to it as deferred prosecutions, um, but we're using it as kind of like a diversion program, but it's not designed for the people that have continually used or engaged in other criminal behavior while they also have possession of controlled substances. Our deferred pros prosecution program, which we wrote a grant for to the state and we're given that funding, is in my opinion to kind of catch the people that started using when it was not a criminal thing. So we're talking about maybe not as high risk, high need offenders that we think we can offer treatment and avoid the criminal justice system up front. It's not gonna get your individuals who have a history of drug dealing, um, manufacture, any sort of delivery, or somebody who is, for example, committing a burglary and has a possession as well. It's gonna be straight possession cases, people that are making poor choices while they're actively using, and hopefully we can intervene and get them some help before they engage in those more serious criminal offenses. We already have the infrastructure to adjust and try to address some of the high risk, high need individuals. That's what our treatment court is designed to impact. Um, individuals who may be dealing, um, things like that, um, or who are committing more serious offenses as a result of their addiction. Mm -hmm. um, but this is kind of a different population and we're trying to catch them before they escalate further. That makes sense. Um, I'm, I will be frank. I'm worried about it. I don't know how many individuals we're actually going to be able to serve, and it has to be voluntary. So somebody might say, no, I'll take my A misdemeanor. It's going to get automatically expunged in a couple years anyway. Who cares? Hmm. I know I'm probably not going to go to jail. Um, it's going to really depend on whether people actually want to stop that. Um, engagement in that behavior or want to change their lives. Um, so I am nervous that it's not going to be what the Salem people consider to be successful. Right. Um, but it also is held up against a standard like for in Salem or some of the bigger counties, they're doing what's called a lead program. And that's where like an officer encounters somebody in the street and they say, okay, you can go through door number one or door number two. Door number one is the jail. Like, nobody wants to go to jail. Door number two, I'm going to call my remote crisis team, and they're going to come and give you a warm handoff. You don't get charged, and you go straight into detox, excuse me, detox or inpatient treatment. The issue is, for us... We don't have it. We don't have that mobile, right. like, right. magic <laughs> mystery machine to show up with all of these, uh, right. you know, uh, social workers. And then, even if we did, where are we going to take them? Right, right, Like, right. if somebody says, you're right, sorry, officer... 
I'd really like to get clean and sober. Thanks for meeting me where I'm at. You're number 86 on the list. Exactly. Take, <laughs> yeah. take Here's me. a phone. Here's I would like door number two. Where is that? We're going to go. Yeah. Well, so we can put you in a hotel for 48 hours and then we'll put you on a list and we can call every day. And I mean, it's just not realistic. And so the funding that, yeah, yeah, the funding that was available would not afford us to actually set up that kind of a program. So it was really a non-starter. We're doing a program that we think we can do with the resources we have. Um, but, I mean, if we're going to get compared to what these other counties are doing, it's really not realistic in any way. It's just an unrealistic expectation for especially rural communities. If you're right. going to find somebody and have an officer have that interaction and, you know, for example, Elgin or North Powder... Like, we're going to sit here for 45 minutes while we wait for an, a mobile crisis yeah. person to get up and running and come. Right. We just don't have right. those resources in the way that the expectation is. So um, there are definitely some flaws in the legislation in terms of, you know, what we can actually do versus what I think they they thought we should be doing. So, so the details in the unclassified misdemeanor mm -hmm. are still similar. The, I mean, the, so you said... You know, okay, I'll just take the misdemeanor A. Well, uh, like an unclassified misdemeanor, yeah. Well, I mean, so they still the you can still be prosecuted for it, right? But the but the teeth is not really enough. It's not the same as it was before. Okay. A felony is a much heavier yeah. penalty, right? Which Army was part of the forever. not necessarily no. Well, <laughs> you can have it expunged right. at some point in time. Um, but it is a much heavier, you know, collateral consequence. You're a convicted felon right, right, for that right. amount. And that was part of the reason that people were, you know, pushing for a change. Right. It just went to the absolute extreme. Right. Um, and now we're just trying to figure it out to, well, I'm not. I mean, right, we right. know what needs to happen. It's trying to, you know, get the legislature to understand that and then facilitate it in a way that's reasonable for the communities that they're trying to serve. Um, so I, I guess I had thought that them classifying it as an unclassified misdemeanor might have given the opportunity so so Eastern Oregon could add more teeth to that because that's what they would prefer rather than Western Oregon. Is that the case or are they still, I mean, is there, because there, before there was hardly any disincentive is there a disincentive now? I mean, you would have a misdemeanor conviction right. and you'd be on probation. You'd be ordered into treatment. Yeah. You would end up being ordered to do the same things essentially you would do in a deferred prosecution. You by choice. Yeah. But you would do it by choice. You'd probably get it done faster and it would come off your record. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not we can get people to do that. Right. Um, the biggest thing with 4002 for law enforcement um, is it changes the threshold for what they can do for investigations. Because you can't write a search warrant for um, a violation amount of drugs. So when it used to be a felony for, you know, your meth pipe. Yeah, you could get a search warrant. You could get a search warrant for that. If you see, find a small amount on someone, that would be something you could use to build probable cause to get into a house, to get into a car, to search someone's backpack. But the second that became a violation, it's not. Okay. It's not enough, and you would have to articulate further um, additional evidence so that you could get to probable cause, so then you could get into things. So okay. I think that was really hard, too, for um, citizens to understand, too, just right. because you know that that person has drugs. That's not going to be enough for us to open a, a larger-scale investigation to try to address you know, what we think we know versus what we can prove. Um, so the 4002 does give law enforcement more tools okay. in that regard to um, investigate and to build cases based on what they're seeing. That's crazy to me. Like, you know they have drugs, but you can't get a, uh, you bust them with, dr with drugs, say, and you couldn't get a search warrant, like, because you don't have enough reasonable suspicion. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, the the, the legality of it is that you have to be able to say that I know or I expect that because they have a user amount, there's going to be additional drugs that would be criminal. Right. And if all you have is a smaller amount of user um, user amount or user quantity and it's a violation, yeah. 
the law is going to tell you, no, you don't. Right. You're going to have to have something else. Now that it's a misdemeanor, that gets us in the door better. I wonder how many, like, I wonder what the percentage is. I, I'm going to look into that. Like, it, back when it was still just a violation, what was the percentage of times that people have more at home or, or are doing something, you know what I mean? Or right. have some stolen stuff in their garage. Or I wonder what if there's numbers on that that show how 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 probable it is that they're you know doing something else or have more drugs i bet you it's pretty damn high i think that was one of the most frustrating <laughs> things for like the da's office and law enforcement is as i said what we know and what we can prove mm -hmm. might be two different things right so that was definitely a struggle and definitely frustrating too because you have family members who are telling you you know my son or daughter right. is using yeah. and making all these horrible choices and it's a violation. I'm going to give them a hundred dollar fine and they can make one phone call and then the hundred dollar fine goes away. In what world is that doing that person any right. good? It just makes not, everyone yeah. frustrated. Right. So has 2004, has it made a difference locally? 4002? 4002, yeah. Um, I mean, definitely we've seen some cases that are coming in. Um, yeah. We haven't had, we just hired for the deferred prosecution coordinator who's working with um, our local defense consortium attorney, Logan Joseph, and we will be putting together that program um, coming off the ground here pretty quick. We haven't seen that many citations though that are coming in that is just a straight possession of a controlled substance. We've seen like trespasses or um, minor theft cases where the person has um, controlled substance on their person, mm -hmm. so they're not going to qualify for that. Um, but very minimal in terms of just the deferred prosecution. Mm -hmm. um, but we've certainly seen a spike in the numbers of people that are being charged now with this unclassified misdemeanor. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So totally off the question, but since okay. you're here, so so. So there's, there's a thing going around where if people put a trespass sign up on their property and somebody camps on their property, they can have them removed. This is like out in Union County or whatever. But if they don't have a trespass sign and somebody camps on their property, then it's more complicated to get them off. Is there anything to that? Do you have any? I haven't heard that. Okay. Um, I haven't seen a case like that But generally... Recently. If somebody, it's always a good idea to post no trespassing signs as a landowner or property owner. But I mean, let's say I, I live in Island City and I have a, you know, part of a property that I don't use. Do I really? I mean, if somebody were to jump the fence, it's an enclosed area. You're in camp. You're, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. you shoot them with a pellet gun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't shoot the cat. Okay. So I have to no, tell I'm you. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. No. Don't do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call law enforcement yeah, and ask yeah. for their assistance, yeah. but you have the right to your property yeah. and you can exclude anybody you want from yeah. your property. You can have them trespass too. Like you can call the cops. Sure. Right, say, right. Well, which they aren't going to get arrested. The cops are just going to come and say, get out of here. If you come back, I arrest yeah. you. Yeah. That's usually how it works. Yeah. Um, but depending on how that person responds to it, they may get arrested. Yeah, you never know. Be. Okay. So let's switch topics again because we were talking a little bit offline about. Mm -hmm cold cases right. and, and you know, and so, cause, cause there are some podcasts that are out there about LeGrand and pod, you know, so h help us understand how, how did some of those people get that information? At what point, you know, if you have a, a case that's a number of years old, at what point is that information available to the public to get and i mean just talk about that whole thing so that's kind of a complicated area of law um okay. there's two conflicting you know bodies of ways or rather of thinking about it usually records that are over 25 years old become public record however medical examiner records are treated differently and can't be released in the same way only hmm. certain designated people are entitled to get um, certain records from medical examiner um, autopsy reports, if you will, medic medical examiner reports. And also there's um, a public body can reject one of those requests if it's an ongoing and active investigation. If they can articulate that releasing those records would impact or impede or interfere with their current investigation. Makes sense. So really it's a case-by-case -case basis in terms of whether or not 
because um, there's two ways of looking at a cold case, right? You want to get all the information that you can out there because you don't know what you share is going to trigger somebody's memory. Somebody mm -hmm. might say, oh, wait, I did know that or my cousin talked about yeah. that or whatever yeah. it is. But the flip side of that is sometimes um, cold cases break open when people don't think that there's someone listening or paying attention. Yeah. So there are some... Um, the surprise element after a period of time may be a useful tool in some investigations. Mm -hmm. So it really just depends on the investigation and then kind of the plan of the investigating officer. So when you talk about the autopsy and the medical examiner records uh, being, you know, kind of like constricted to people, yeah. how, how do we always see the, the celebrity ones? Is that something you're not supposed to? Them? People get fired over oh, that. Oh, okay. So that's leaking. <laughs> Somebody's leaking those. Yeah, typically. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I was wondering about that. The, I also can't speak to outside of Oregon. I know what the Oregon rules are there. Like immediate family members and designees are allowed to get some of those records, but any Joe Schmo off the street can't come and request an autopsy report or photos of an autopsy. And to no, be fair, they shouldn't. No, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that'd be weird. There, but there are people that want to, and, I guarantee and, uh, Fun fact as an aside, in public records requests, you can't ask why someone is asking for it. So if you did get one of those requests, you're going to be like, excuse me, sir, what are you going to do? What are you, gonna, gonna do what, are you like, what are you trying to do over oh, here? Oh, don't worry. I got a skin suit in my basement and pictures <laughs> oh. of, of autopsies all over the wall. Yeah, that's just weird, <laughs> gross, and wrong. <laughs> uh, but there is different you know, different ways of approaching it. And that's such a lawyer answer too of like, well, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but in most, and we talked about this before last time you were here. Yeah. And that is, is that in any investigation, there are some nuggets per se that maybe only the killer would know only, you know, right. right. And so some of those things you're purposely going to hold back in some manner or not because, For sure. because then that, that can be an identifier if even somehow in an interview, if some, somebody, a suspect, you know, they reveal something that they know that only. Right. Yeah. And that's a tactic you use in like any investigation. Right. Right. If you have a suspect that says something or provides a detail before yeah. you tell them. Yeah. Um, that's obviously something that, that we care about. Do you okay. know off the top of your head, how many open, uh, cold cases we have in Union County? Off the top of my head, yeah, I can tell or a you. Rough the, estimate. Well, I can tell. Well, it depends because um, OSP has centralized some of their Oregon State Police has centralized some of their cold case actions, and so they are being investigated outside of the Union County area uh, okay. um, on some of them. So, so if that's a Oregon State Police generated investigation, it right? Might like, be. there's one that I know we're actively working, and the detective is out of the Ontario office. Okay. Um, so there's a little bit of scattered, and then we've changed a little bit too because in the last year and a half, my office has secured an investigator. Um, Mike, yeah, you talked about that. Last yeah, time, Mike yeah. Harris was a detective sergeant at Legrand, um, and he's been working for my office, and he had worked on some of those cases when he was at Legrand, and so. Um, he's kind of carried them over into our office. And so our office has um, the responsibility or has taken over some of those. Um, the sheriff's office and then LeGrand, usually we work those as major crimes. And there's a few that are quote unquote cold cases from like the 30s. Um, we wouldn't necessarily put them in the same category in terms of whether or not they're workable, right. if you will. Um, but they're, there's less than 10. Less than 10. And that, and so what day, like, is that like starting in the 80s, the 90s? Like, it, well, is there a rough? Um, I think the oldest one that we have at our office is Sylvia Heitzman. Yeah. Um, and then you obviously have the Dana Dumars case, which was 1982. Yeah. And then Jamma Harms, which was, um, I believe, 1999, 1996, mid 90s. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Um, no, is there, I mean, is there, you know, when you kind of hover over that stuff, are there times where it's like, oh man, I mean, as an investigator, it's like you're solving a puzzle, you have all of the pieces, but you're missing just some things, you know, is there a time where there's hopeful? I mean, you know, I, and I guess kind of 
Is there a point where it's like, okay, this is a closed, you, you, we talked earlier, you don't really close a case. Yeah. Um, people always ask that and right. they're like, Hey, what do I, what do we have to do to get this case reopened? Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's not like a stamp that you put on a file and you're like, this is a closed case. This is an open case. Aha. Right. I'll get it back out and right. designate it open now. <laughs> um, it's really a resource issue in terms of being able to devote time and energy to that. Yeah. Um, certainly cold cases are an, their own unique animal because most of them don't have the tools that you know, what do we use now? We track cell phones, we look at security yeah. footage, we get in bank accounts, we do all kinds of investigative things that are just not available. Um, that doesn't make them a weaker case, it just makes it different and more um, labor intensive to try to get that information um, from where it needs to come from. And it really requires people to talk. Yeah. Do, do you ever get to be involved in like, uh, how, like, I mean, obviously you have a lot of responsibility at, as the district attorney, but do you ever get to be involved in any uh, cold cases? Like, do you get to yeah. kind of dive in? Do you yeah. like doing that? Um, yeah, I don't do any interviews. I can't be a witness in my own case. Right, um, But I certainly help with a lot of investigations. I mean, I go to all the crime scenes, and um, I definitely am That'd a part probably be my favorite part, is just being... If I was the district attorney, I would want to like work cold cases. Like if for some reason it just interests me. Um, I mean, we definitely have um, a, a very intense involvement, I would say. Um, I have good close working relationships with our major crimes team. So, um, you know, we have one case that we've been working pretty aggressively and um, I've been a part of those discussions and decision making in terms of like, is there something we can test that the test wasn't available back then? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when was the last time somebody touched this? And since then, what resources are available to us that this evidence might lend itself to give us information? Um, and, and that's, I mean, I don't want to say fun because that sounds kind of weird, but I, mean, I think I, it's That fun. is a little bit of the puzzle. I think it's yeah. fun. I, I yeah. don't think it's weird. I think, I mean, that, you, you have to find joy in your job. Otherwise, it's not, you know, why do it? Uh, yes, it, we definitely get that. And we definitely get the dark sense of humor part of it. Like, yeah. If you don't laugh about some things, eventually you just cry. So. Yeah, you have to, right. <laughs> um, we just have to, you know, remember that not everybody deals with the things that we do on a daily basis. So let's talk about interrogations for a minute. because Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, I, because, because, and what, what rules does an interrogator have to stay in? Because they can, I mean, they they can, I mean, if you have two suspects, you can go in and, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, they say, yeah, like, hey, the other dude gave you up. Do you want to give him, I mean. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So, so what can they do and what can they not do? Well, I mean, I think it's more of like best practices. Yeah. In turn, I mean, obviously there are constitutional protections. Like right. right. You cannot threaten someone. Can't you cannot violate their heads. Well, <laughs> and you can't violate their rights. Yeah. So if you know, you have to respect their constitutional rights. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Um, so there are some times where, you know, officers are allowed to bluff on something. But there are also times where even if you could do that, it's not a good idea because what if your bluff is called and you don't have DNA evidence to right. support right. whatever it is you're saying idea. or whatever. So um, really the case law is what structures that, but then also just really good training in terms of making sure that you're asking questions in a way that are not leading or suggesting. That's really where the controversy comes in and where people talk about false confessions or things like that or... Um, that's kind of um, what we talk about in terms of best practices versus, you know, the law or right. rules as you're asking. Right, about. because all of that interrogation is going to be a part of the case at some point. Right. And so then, so then if an interrogator stepped over the line at some point and got some evidence, then and they did they did something in, inappropriate, then the defense could say, yeah, but that they used this particular way of getting that information. And so that information can be thrown out. I mean, right. Is, is so right? like, Am and I that's, thinking? that's referring to really like um, your constitutional rights. So yeah. if you're being interviewed and, and somebody says, you know, I think I might want to talk to a lawyer. Um, 
it's important that the officer then doesn't say like, are you sure about that? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, we're well trained in terms of shutting that down, but in the event that someone did say, are you sure about that? And then they convince them, no, let's keep talking. Then yes, it's possible that anything they say after that is completely thrown out, which can bust an entire case. Right. If they say, yeah, I did it. And here's where the evidence is. Everything that flows from there is going to be inadmissible and not something that we can use, which right. I talk a lot about um, solving a case mm -hmm. is not the same as proving a case. So oh, you can true. know what somebody did or, you know, you say, hey, I think my you know, nephew stole from me. Well, that might be solving a case, but that's not building a case that we can prove or proving a case. Those right. are two different things. Do we have the ATM video? Do we have the... Um, the, the actual documents. Can we get into that bank account? Like, it's not so simple as just to say, this is who did it. Yeah. And we know that that's the outcome because proving it looks very different. Yeah. That's crazy. All right. Well. It sounds stressful to me. It can be. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, Kelsey, thank you. Yeah. We, we always have, I mean, when you, when you came in, it's like, what are we going to talk about? It's like, I don't know. We just I know I you mean, didn't we even just, talk just, about the stuff you told me you were going to talk about. We just we just start talking and it just flows. Yeah. So. The more organic, the better. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah. We, we really appreciate you yeah. coming Thanks. on. And again, we're we're going to have Gabe is going to reach out to you so that we can get you on the calendar on a regular basis. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you want to right, get yeah, Let's get it. But let me read this comment real fast. Okay. Greg Mack says. Baker has its three-on-three -three basketball tournament at Baker High School Friday and Saturday. Jabron and Amy Jones, who Jabron's a, the coach at Baker and he's an EOU grad, host this every year to support youth basketball. I think 55 teams are signed up. Always fun to watch. Would love to have you guys come just for a visit. Probably not, but maybe. Um, on this day, November 7th, uh, 1786, the oldest performing musical organization in the United States is founded in Staunton, Massachusetts. The Stoughton Musical Society. 1805 on this day, Lewis and Clark Expedition first sights the Pacific Ocean at the mouth of the Columbia River. Wow, can you imagine? 1874, the first cartoon depicting an elephant as the Republican Party symbol is published by Thomas Nast. 1916, Jeanette Rankin, a uh, representative from Montana, is elected to con Congress as its first women's representative. 1972, this is crazy. I didn't know he was this old. Uh, Attorney Joe Biden is elected to the U.S. Senate, representing the state of Delaware. He beat his, the other guy by just over 3,000 votes, but he was reelected six times. Six <laughs> times. But 1991, Magic Johnson announces he has HIV and retires from the Los Angeles Lakers. 2019, in Nature Magazine, humans are reported to have walked upright 12 million years ago, previously thought to be 6 million years ago, according to a new uh, study of a species of ape found in Bavaria, Germany. 2020, Kamala Harris makes U.S. history as the first woman and the first woman of color to be elected to the vice presidency. On this day in 2004, the number one movie in America, The Incredibles. And then the quote of the day comes from Confucius. I, 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 I like this one. Life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. <laughs> one more time. Life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. All right. Thank thanks you, again, Kelsey. Kelsey. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate thanks it. For doing Thank you, you, as always. Thank you, guys. We'll see you soon.